doesn't make much sense to me, so to talk no sense makes perfect sense in a way. Hey everybody, thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 320. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Mr. Paul Reed, better known to some of you as the Teapot Monk. If you're new to the show, you can find the show notes at Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. You can find the full complement of our products and digital services at whistlekick.com. You can find our products on Amazon too, for the most part. Check out Whistlekick first. You'll see everything there and then... We drop some links into what's on Amazon, make it nice and easy for you. You know, I haven't asked for reviews in quite a long time. So if you like this show, wherever you're getting it from, if you get it from iTunes, if you get it from Stitcher, just drop on, leave us a review, help us grow, help us, you know, find other people. Or if you don't want to do that, just share it with somebody, tell somebody about it, tie them to a chair and make them listen. Don't do that. Let's talk about today's show. Mr. Paul Reed is a Tai Chi instructor with quite a strong online presence. In fact, if you were to look up Tai Chi online, you would not have to look very far to find him. And because of that, because of his skill, because of his passion for sharing what he has learned, he has quite the following. And it was from one of his online followers that we got an email and said, hey, This guy deserves a place on the show. Now, I was a little bit familiar with what he had going on, but as you might imagine, we get so many suggestions that I often wait for a listener to reach out and say, this is someone that belongs on the show. Kind of a a way of letting others vet who our guests might be. But I reached out and received a response fairly quickly, and it was very clear from those initial emails, that this was going to be an exceptional episode. And it is. I had so much fun. I learned so much. And truth be told, I suspect we could have gone much, much longer with great conversation. So I'll step back. I won't set it up any more than that. And I want you to listen to my conversation with the teapot monk, Mr. Paul Reed. How are you, Mr. Reed? I'm just assessing the situation. Bear with me two seconds. Sure, no worries. So you've been up a long time already, have you? I thought you just stumbled out of bed five minutes ago. (laughs) I wish that was my lifestyle. No, I've been up, uh, let's see, uh, nearly five hours now. Wow, I think you got up before I did then. Quite possible. No, Quite I'm possible. joking. I'm joking. It's three, it's three o'clock in the afternoon oh, here. Oh, then, then certainly not. <laughs> Although, well, the odd, I, day, I the odd day maybe, but uh, yeah. no, not today. So I think we're okay, are we? How's sound and stuff? Good. Okay. So how are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. It's, this is the first time I've used this microphone with a call a uh, a uh, audio call so uh this is the microphone i usually use when i'm doing um, uh an audio book so it might be you know, i'm just hoping that it's going to be all right no, the, the only other great. microphone i had was a is it sound okay good sounds great. okay yeah right. good okay enough of that then <laughs> <laughs> so you've been up a while glad to hear it yeah. so you're Raring to go, presumably, or, or I not, am. depending on you are. I am. Okay. Well, if I if 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 I if I remember correctly, the the uh, the order of your previous shows, and I can't say I've listened to them all, but there's a few I've definitely played through. You surprise your guests by saying, "Hey, you know we're already rolling, don't you?" And they go, <laughs> "Quite what? often, I do that. Quite what? often, and and you know." And and I'll be I'll be really honest. I, and I don't know that I've I've told. I think I've told this story once. But what happened was, I we we did an episode with a gentleman from Australia named Sensei David Hughes, and we were fifteen minutes into just kind of our pre-show chat, and I realized this is really good stuff. Mm. The listeners would appreciate hearing this, I think, because I I try to put myself in the position of the listeners. 
And we got so much good feedback on the episodes over the next few weeks where I did that. Yeah. That I said, you know what? Let's make it that more natural, that more conversational. I, I needed the structure early on. I had no interview experience. Yeah. And as I Plus, become yeah. more comfortable, it's like anything in martial arts, right? Well, I think it's like anything in life, really, Jeremy. I think it's, it's you know, initially you want structure and you want guidelines. And then as you become more confident and more, I suppose, confident in yourself rather than necessarily the the medium in which you're using. But, you know, hopefully you get to that point in which you require less dependency on those props and more on your own sense and your own intuition. I'd like to think so anyway. Sure. I I think that's really a, a good lens to look at probably anything in life. I mean, that, that, as you said, that's life. The ability sure. to to, yeah. to look around. I mean, if, if I think of, you know, children have all of these rules. And of course, as, as we grow, we learn that, that rules aren't necessarily made to be broken, but they need to be broken because rules can't handle all conditions. Mm, I'm enjoying the synergy there. I like it. Ah, okay. There, I, I, I'm aware that there's a time lapse between finishing and beginning, which is going to be curious. Is this always the case? I presume it is when we're doing distance calls to the extent that we are, that oh. there, is a, there is a sense of, you know, we're not aware that you're necessarily finished. It could be that the microphone cable has just become dislodged a moment. And there's that sense of just a momentary microsecond or two where you're thinking, has he nodded off? He, <laughs> I'm actually not experiencing that. Oh, okay. So that's uh, because you're an experienced interviewer, Jeremy. Oh, oh is that I'm, it? I'm just a humble in English human being who's in awe of your interviewing skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if if you if you were brown nosing for anything, I, I think you can ask it at at this point. I, th I think we're um, there. Okay, but I've got I've got to ask you. Mm. You ha you have an interesting online moniker. Can you Monica. tell us about that? Your 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 alias, your stage name. Okay. Interestingly, you called it a stage name. I'd never thought of it in those terms before. Because a lot of what this this character, the teapot monk, represents and has represented now for quite some time is someone who employs the postures of Tai Chi and interprets them in ways that he feels are useful in his life, rather than the ways that they've traditionally been handed down and the interpretations that they've been given by schools and teachers in a more broader sense of taking into account the history and culture of and background of the art. So T. Bomong's one of these guys that, um, you know, uh, who is it who said uh, it's probably – I think it was someone like Picasso, but it probably, I've got it completely wrong. It's probably someone like Bob Hope. But it's, someone said there are two sorts of artists in the world. One responds to the history of his art and the other responds to life himself. Well, uh, I think I respond to the history, but my online persona, Teapot Monk, he gets more liberty and he gets more license to respond to, to life. And so in a way, he's, he's the person who 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 looks at the world through the lens of Tai Chi, but um, with a very strong foot in the 21st century. And uh, the idea of using the description teapot monk really has its origins in when I first started learning Tai Chi, which was way back in the 1980s in London, during a time in which there was a, there was a hotbed of schools uh, competing with one another in a very small, well, when I say small area, in a relatively small area, um, each of them slagging each other off and denouncing each other as fraudulent and um, not following the the guidelines and the wishes of the grandmasters of each separate school. And as I, uh, when I started learning Tai Chi, I was learning, uh, not, I didn't tell my teachers at the time, I was doing three different styles at the same time until I got caught out. And then each of them refused to teach me again because they said I'm betraying the principles of the style because I shouldn't be learning the competition at the same time. And it was it was silliness. And 
So eventually I stuck with one style and my teacher went back to the country from, of her origin and I took over from her. And, and uh, I realized that when people started asking me about what style I was teaching and where my uh, lineage was from and who taught me, et cetera, et cetera, I was falling into this same game that everyone got into, which was playing down others in order to boost your own particular path. And, and so I called it the teapot style just because I thought no one would take it serious and, and no one did take it serious. And whenever one, anyone said to me, you know, oh, that doesn't make any sense, I would say, well, I, I live in a, in a world that doesn't make much sense to me. So to talk no sense makes perfect sense in a way. And the name sort of stuck. Um, and I've been using that name since. So it has a sort of playfulness about it, uh, something that hopefully no one in their right mind would consider you know, me putting it forward as a serious style or even myself as a serious player in that sense, in the sense of that you're, you're, um, you're shackled to the past in some sense. Do you understand what I'm saying, Jeremy? Are you still there? Have you nodded off? No, I'm, I'm, I'm here and I'm nodding along rather than nodding <laughs> off. <laughs> that's, that's a relief. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, I remember a time, and, and I think I've talked about this a, a, a bit. Um, back as a teenager, I, I was, you know, I was bullied. I was, for the most, I, I considered myself the school nerd, didn't have a lot of friends, et cetera. And I found solace in creating this alter ego as I started to use the internet. And I, in, in hindsight, that was an important part of my development, the, the realization that I could be someone else. Is there any semblance of that for you with t being the teapot monk? Is there a dramatic difference between the teapot monk and Paul Reed? I think perhaps at one point there was. And yeah, I mean, I, yeah, this that's a really great question because uh, I think when we first started, um, and I think like you, you've had a background in technology. Is that right, Jeremy? Yeah, I too took a degree in technology, and and I and I, I feel like I've I've always been there since since the beginning in a sense. And I do remember there was a point in when the internet first started uh, spreading like an epidemic that we we embraced avatars. Uh, we we used pseudonyms. Um, many of us gave fake names or birth dates or uh, put cartoon images of ourselves rather than real photographs. And it hasn't been until a fairly recent period, I believe, that particularly with social media, there has been an insistence on us being much more honest about who we are. We can no longer get away with that so easily. So uh, over time, the Teapot Monk, as, a, as an online character, uh, fused with my real life persona. And at some point in the past, I wish I could put a date on it exactly, but there was a period in which they seemed to sort of blend in together. And I think the Teapot Monk lost some of his, some of his qualities, and, um, and I became a bit more like him, and he became a bit more like me, I think, over the course of time. So, yeah, yeah. Talk talk about that that loss of of quality. Or not not quite the right way to phrase it, but you said the teapot monk lost some some of his qualities. What what's different? Right. Um, yeah. Well, I think <laughs> when he started off, when he started, he started as a reaction to things. So there was this sense in which. Um, he played a game. The idea was that his existence was to really turn things upside down. So without having any answers, without having any sense of anything better to offer, his purpose in the like was just be to sort of poke holes at things. And that took the, took the form um, of um, laughing at a lot of structures that were there in the martial arts back in the 80s and 90s. And but this took a sort of personal uh, path for me because I'd been 
coming from a series of other martial arts long before I got into Tai Chi. And whilst I was still teaching Tai Chi, I was engaged in other forms of work to do with fitness training. And I was required in those fields to go through a number of certified courses in order to do that correctly. So on the one hand, I had this very thorough, um, practical, exam, examined history. And on the other side, this long martial arts history in which I had been told so many things about the way the body works or the best ways of exercising or the safest ways of doing this. And then I had all this other information on my side and I didn't quite know what to do with it. So the teapot monk had a, had a role to and a role there to point out some of those those holes. And over the course of time, I think I became more confident and embraced some of that. And he became less of that character whose only function was to point at the holes and became a little bit more responsible, which I like to think he is now, and plays a little bit more positive role in that and less walks around um, tripping people up. You know. In a, in a sort of digital format, if that makes any sense. <laughs> it does. All kinds of sense. I, I think we all have the experience, whether it's something structured as being an online persona, of what it's like to feel that we wear a mask. You know, I, I don't think that anyone portrays themselves exactly the same to any two people. I know that when I'm speaking with my friends or when I'm speaking with you or you know, last night when I was teaching at a, at a friend's Taekwondo school, I'm a slightly different person because the mm. situation warrants that. Mm. But mm. I think, you know, just kind of listening to the way you're articulating this, the fusion of these two major components of who you were, I think that that's an important part of growth. I think that that's something that a lot of us in martial arts, whether we realize it or not, it's something that we're trying to do. We have this idea of who we want to be as a martial artist or as a human being that martial arts can help mold. And we're striving for that, whether that's, you know, something as outward as losing weight or something as inwardly powerful as dealing with issues around anger or, or maybe abuse. Mm. And it can be such a beautiful tool. I like the the word fusion. I think that's uh, that's an interesting. That's an interesting. It seems to keep popping up, and it sometimes pops up in in negative connotation, whereby people start saying, "Ha, what you're teaching isn't Tai Chi. It's Tai Chi Pilates or or Yoga Karate." Um, and in that sense, it gets a sort of negative negative. Uh, welcome but there's another sense in which i find that that movement from one stance to another that may not necessarily always have followed but something that you're exploring in the process of taking that path that fusion is possibly the thing that i'm always in search of you know that idea of what is appropriate for this moment. When you described yourself teaching in this Taekwondo class last night and you become this other persona, you, you're responding to the elements that are there around you. You are hopefully you're adaptable and flexible enough to be able to do that. You have a broad agenda and a, and a fairly decent toolkit in which you can pluck out what you think are the appropriate exercises and drills for that class. And that's what I hope I would like to think that we all are trying to do in our teachings and our, our martial arts and, and beyond that in life, that we're always looking to see what's appropriate in the moment, what's the most effective tool we can use at this particular point, irrespective of what we have been trained to do. Hopefully we have the confidence and the 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 inner strength to be able to stride forward without necessarily having every step previously ordained by a master or two who's mm. turned up on our path. Mm -hmm. 
Now, you, you mentioned a couple times that you have martial arts experience outside of Tai Chi, prior to Tai Chi, and I'm going to guess that those were not soft or internal arts or however you choose to label them. Am I guessing correctly? I think when we numerically balance up all the variety of martial arts in the world, I would expect that the what we what some people define as internal, some people define as soft. There's, there's, they certainly are the minority, I would have imagined. Mm, I, I think so. These, these categories of hard and soft and internal, external, and I'm not sure I, I, I'm, I particularly subscribe to any of those, but in order to answer your question uh, in, a, in a short way, then, yeah, yeah, there was, I mean, I started probably back when I was 10 or 11 years old. I just moved out of London um, and my, my parents had dumped us all off and we'd moved down to the East Coast in Great Britain and to set up another life down there doing, I can't remember what at the time, but, but I, we'd moved around a lot as a kid. Uh, my, my dad used to like moving us every year or two. I'm, I'm sure we were running away from debts, but he never explained exactly why, but every year or two off we would go again, everything packed in the car and we'd turn up in another town. But as a kid, you know, I would go from school to school and you would feel the outsider always. You would always feel as though you're the the person outside of the the, the norm. And so being quite small as well, I'm only 5'7", I've got a rather fragile structure to my body. I suppose I was always interested in working out how I was going to defend myself. And this is a common history, I suppose, amongst many, many martial artists. But I do remember coming home regularly with my mum from the library and taking home stacks of books every week. I was a voracious reader. I just wanted to read everything. And at one point, I remember bringing home a couple of really big hardback books, one of which I think was Masoyama's um, This Is Karate, that was this enormous great big coffee book, uh, coffee table book, like a sort of uh, telephone book. And it was full of all these black and white faded pictures of of him doing these strange postures in this in this uniform that looked far too tight for his body. And I found this to be uh, a great exotic world of which was such a contrast to my what I thought of was a rather mundane existence. And so I searched out everything I could to find out more about this life because it seemed to me to offer a, a history, a tradition, a ritual. A, something that was sadly lacking in in the 1970s at that point in in the UK, United Kingdom. So I, I remember stumbling across some books, and uh, this is where, probably where my martial arts began. I, I, I found a whole series of books by a guy called Bruce Tegner. Do you, have you heard of this guy? I haven't. I haven't. I'm making a note. Bruce Tegner, T-E-G-N... AR or ER, I can't remember why, but I mean, this this guy, he must have released about 60 or 70 books in the 60s, 1960s. I think he was from California. I can't remember. But they were all little paperbacks. It was like Bruce Tegner's Guide to Judo and Jiu-Jitsu, Bruce Tegner's Guide to Kung Fu and Tai Chi, Bruce Tegner's Guide to, he had his own style of which he linked Judo and Aikido, I think it was. Jukaido or something like this. Bruce Tegner's book of Aikido. Bruce Tegner's book of oh, it was, uh, and it was the same format, exactly the same. It's about two thousand photographs of him inside doing these really static postures of, you know, someone grabs me around the back of the neck, and and what do I do? I sort of grab the person by the hair and I flip them over my back and you know, elbow them in the solar plexus, and that's it. And again, he was another guy who wore a, a, a karate gi that looked about five sizes too short for him. Um, but I was just, uh, I just loved these books. This is what got me into the martial arts, probably just before I'd ever heard of Bruce Lee or anything like this. And I was just thinking, oh, God, this is it's fantastic. And I actually believed that these things were really practical. So I would study these these paperbacks. And then eventually, a couple of years later, I went to a, uh, and my dad kicked me into a, a, a com- constantly was on at him saying, I need to I need to learn some martial arts. So he kicked me into this judo kwai, this judo center around the corner. And I was I had 13, probably about as high as uh, the average person's 
in the thigh at that time. And there was no classes, no kids' classes. It was just the one adult's class. And I went in there and I just got lobbed about. I couldn't I couldn't possibly throw anybody. I couldn't even reach their waist, let alone. So I certainly stuck that for a few weeks and then eventually found a karate class in the near next town. And just I uh, just I thought I'd just found a world that had been missing to me for my whole life up until that point. I found a comrade or a, a, a sense of belonging, um, uh, a sense of discipline. I knew what to do, where to go. There was a hierarchy, a very strong hierarchy in terms of my gradings, um, uh, respect, physical challenges. And at that time, you know, I stayed in this class, this class for until I was about 16 or 17, until I had to take my black belt and um, during the grading of the black belt. And this was this is another story of which I'll, I'll stop now. But um, I didn't get the black belt. I failed in the black belt grading and I got completely beaten up in the, in the freestyle session. And I learned something really interesting, though, that uh, it was through that loss, that failure, that, that not achieving what I thought I was going to achieve that ultimately would turn out to be probably the most important lesson. But at that time, I felt really disillusioned and left the class, went and joined a com- 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 competitive class around the corner, another Shudokan class, got fed up with that one, joined the Taekwondo class, got fed up with that one, went back to another karate class, stayed with them for a while, and then Ended up going to university, ditching the whole thing, coming out of university the other side, learning some Wing Chun later later in life, loved the Chinese aspect of that, had some serious fights, lost some very badly in a whole series of street incidents, didn't didn't like any of that, realised that Wing Chun was probably not the answer, decided that maybe the responses to the world that I've been searching for in terms of physical force, maybe I needed to rethink that, took up Aikido, thought maybe I would learn more about dialogue rather than force. Got really beaten up in that, mostly through landing awkwardly, having been thrown. Finally ended up in Tai Chi and realised, I think, that the answers to the world weren't in physical force or dialogue, but possibly in learning to listen more, find a bit more balance spontaneity, yielding, those sorts of things. And that became my uh, journey in Tai Chi. Mm. Your path, bouncing around what, let's, let's just say for the sake of argument, because it's easier to group things, your, your trials through harder arts, leading you ultimately to two feet firmly planted on the softer side. It's certainly not a novel story, and it's certainly one that we've heard here on the show a number of times. But I'm I'm curious, because I can hear you saying it in hindsight, that you were very aware you were searching for something. Were you at all aware of that while it was happening? I think I was aware of it... Um, I think there was a conscious side to everything here that I I needed to satisfy certain physical demands, physical challenges as a teenager. As you do, um, you needed to ex- you need to do express yourself physically, and those skills that you were learning to do with balance and speed and force and strength and grounding were being addressed by those external arts. But as time moved on and I acquired those skills, the pursuit of those skills in themselves was no longer satisfying. And I knew that they had all of them a deeper level to them, but I wasn't I wasn't scratching away. I couldn't find that deeper level within those particular classes that I was attending with the instructors that I had. Not to say that you couldn't in other classes, but in the classes that I were attending, it was very difficult to go beyond those relatively superficial levels and definitions of those concepts. And it wasn't until I started playing around with the more softer arts, such as Aikido, Firstly, coming across it, I think, in the Wing Chun classes, because that introduced me to a non-linear approach to learning 
that the Japanese arts had very much always embraced. But the coming across some of those more spiral, circular forms of energy and movement in Wing Chung that strangely are there, even though the, a lot of the, the punching is very straight line. But I, I found echoed in Aikido and ultimately in Tai Chi with the the, you know the the uh, the other layers of of meaning there. So when I get to Tai Chi, balance is no longer anything to do with staying upright. It's about um, being able to relate, if not share, in the ideas and conclusions of others. You know, rooting is not just about building a strong posture, but feeling unthreatened by change, by becoming voluntarily vulnerable to adaptation and and movement. And, you know, that whole idea of the bamboo and the bamboo roots always searching out new ground. So yielding is no longer about talking about dealing with strength. It's it's about discourse and it's about finding alternative points of view. Those sorts of things that that come out very strongly from the the principles of Tai Chi that I couldn't find in the other arts. So um, does that answer some of those questions? It does. It does. It. Uh, our, we're having a conversation. It's not, you know, it, all of this is under the guise of you telling the story of who you are as a martial artist at this moment in time. So there are no real wrong answers. I, I've, I've asked questions before that were answered. If we, if we were to turn them right and wrong, were answered so completely wrong to the question mm. that you would think I would, we, we'd go back and delete it. But at the same time, what came out was so beautiful, so beneficial to me, to the listeners, that how could we judge that as wrong? Sure. Right? I'm, I'm here to prompt you more than anything else. Okay, prompt. Prompt ahead, Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> I might prompt back, though. Just be, be careful of that. That's quite all right. When you look back over your time as a martial artist in, in this, this journey, What do you think would have happened if you had found Tai Chi first? Instead of a judo class, your father puts you in a Tai Chi class. Yes, I think I think the, the, the position would have just been more circular. I don't I don't think I would have ended up in a Taekwondo class by my sort of thirties. I don't think that would have happened. I think that I would have then moved beyond, not beyond is probably the is probably too loaded a term, but I think I would have I would have continued to explore those arts until I'd come back to where I'd started. I think it would have been a much more of a circular path. As it happened, uh, it worked out this way. And you know, this is nothing unusual. We we generally tend to do and take those choices that are available to us given our ages. And this is very often a, a pattern that comes up again and again. The people that come to my classes generally tend to come um, because of their age that they're at at the moment. And they're finding something within that that 10 years previously they weren't even aware that they needed to look for. That's not to say younger people don't take up uh, Tai Chi. Clearly, you know, I've been doing it now for nearly 26, 27 years, Tai Chi. And I still find it interesting when people who are coming to my classes in their 20s, and I'm curious as to what they're looking for. Most of the time, it's a balance thing. They're, they're there because they're studying other martial arts and are looking to find a way of exploring aspects of them that they can't do within the art itself. As someone who's trained in a number of different arts, do you think that is something that is inherently necessary in the way those arts are presented? Or do you think there could be a way that, you know, let's say we have a Taekwondo instructor listening and they know, hey, I, I, I agree with the principles that come through in Tai Chi. I agree that this is necessary. Can they be integrated in a way that doesn't lessen the others? Can they be fused in a way that is wholly positive? 
you mean can you take the principles of of something like tai chi and embrace them in more uh more harder arts more external arts is that your that's what you're saying yeah good question i wish i knew the answer <laughs> me too <laughs> i was hoping you could tell me well i think there's a number of uh i don't know whether i'm still talking now about just pure stereotypes now because it's been such a long time since i really studied the other arts but recently i mean i'm i'm giving classes locally here at the moment and i've got a couple of guys that come in to it from from a whole series of mixed martial arts and we play around with seeing where we can overlap different principles and it's it's curious um but i'm aware that i'm i'm really dealing with someone who's 30 years younger than me and looking for something very different right now so their understanding of the terms that i'm using and the the applications that i'm showing and the movements are going to be partly determined by that and that's always going to be an issue the other issues i I find are someone may find it difficult if they've traditionally come through arts that are predominantly korean or japanese and would like to explore the concepts that arise in the chinese martial arts particularly the, the the softer arts there may be areas of overlap, but there may well also be areas of of conflict. And I don't mean that necessarily in a bad sense. I, I do mean it in the sense if there is, there will be another side to it that mm, is going to be more challenging to try and try and balance in some ways. Just on the on the, on the pure basis, you know, there's a whole range of things that we do in. In Tai Chi, I suppose that maybe um, not conflicting, but it may be something to do with um, what would you say? Um, yeah. So, for example, um, there are no belts, there are no uniforms, there are no gradings. There is nothing to determine when you walk into a class whether the person who is talking at that moment in time is the teacher or a student like you who just happened to walk through the door two minutes before you did. Now, there are some schools that have embraced belts and uniforms and gradings, but they've done that for particular reasons appropriate to their school. Traditionally, there isn't that hierarchy. It's a very non-hierarchical, structured form of of martial arts. It has more of a horizontal structure, if that makes any sense, rather than a hierarchical structure. It's very difficult to be clear who's actually learning in that situation. If taught, I believe, in uh, in in the way that I'd like to see Tai Chi taught and something that I try my best to try and do you said right at the very beginning of this Jeremy you said something about being on the stage and there's a posture in Tai Chi called step back to repulse the monkey and I love it because it's about um, teaching us to step down off the stage and it's something that I try my best to work with when giving classes and that is to encourage as many of the people there to learn from each other and to teach me at the same time. So it becomes much more of a, a collective experience and less of a uh, teacher-led experience. So going back to your original question, is it possible to bring these two sides together? Would it be possible to fuse Taekwondo and Tai Chi? There will be schools of Tai Chi that would probably love to do that. Some of the more martial inclined uh, styles would probably say no problem personally as someone who is more driven by the ideology and less by the manifestation of the moves i would say that would be tricky an excellent diplomatic (laughs) response if i have heard (laughs) yes diplomacy i think is important sometimes When you consider your time in martial arts, 
What's your favorite story? Fave story. Um, there's been a lot. Um, and I think none of them are, I'm not someone who's ever won an award. I'm not someone who's ever won a competition. I've got no trophies. I've got no certificates. I haven't trained in China on the Wudan Mountain. I haven't been on any pilgrimages. I've got no gurus. I've never spent any time in caves with hermits. There's nothing that I can I can brag about in terms of my martial arts history. But there are moments in which I believe have been epiphanies for me. There have been moments in which I felt like something has fundamentally shifted beneath my feet. And I'll recall, a, I, I remember telling you earlier that I went for my black belt and lost it because I got beaten up quite badly in the in the finals of the black belt. And that was one of those moments when I just thought, I thought, okay, why am I doing this? For what reason? What is it that I like and what is it that I don't like about that? It took me many, many years to learn the answer to that, but it was part of that process. And that process continued then as I went through other arts and this constant sense of thinking I wanted something out of it and realizing that it was something else when I got close to it. Um, and there was a moment that probably the moment of my life was when I was learning Wing Chun. I was living in East London and there was, let's say, um, a healthy nighttime lifestyle there in which clubs would go out looking to test out their, their, their training late at night on weekends. and. There was an atmosphere there of uh, being okay to do that, different groups versus other groups. And I thought that I was training myself in the ability to, <laughs> to, uh, he laughs because I can't believe I ever thought this, but I did. So, uh, yeah, there I was, late 20s, something like that, living in East London and uh, thinking to myself, yes, I'm street credible. I can handle myself. I studied lots of different martial arts and I'm. I'm studying Wing Chun at the moment, and I'm a formidable opponent despite my size. And I can remember coming out of a, a bar late at night, and uh, I could hear. I was, I was, I was. I'm a, a keen cyclist. I would cycle everywhere in London, and I'd stuck my push bike up on these these railings that were opposite this bar. And in order to get it off, I would have to unlock the, the lock, obviously, and then with both hands lift the bike, the frame of my head in order to pick it up off the railings. Well, it was it was a night in which, unknown to me, not being a keen football fan, that England had just lost an international game to Germany, I remember. And as I was unlocking my bike, I could hear a commotion on the street and a group of people coming down towards me, thinking to myself, street survival technique number one is to completely ignore large loud groups coming towards you to avoid eye contact and carry on as though they're not there. So I employed that defensive technique as it's served me well on previous occasions, proceeded to unlock my bike. And as I was lifting it over my head, I could hear a sort of increased pace of footwork and people running up close behind me. And I thought, well, you know, they're being chased by someone or they're chasing someone. I carry on as I am proceeded to get the bike off the top of the railings. And at that moment, I felt something, a streak of pain going across my neck from ear to ear. And as I dropped the bike and turned, I just managed to get a hand up to stop a second assailant with a knife going for the front of my throat. My back of my neck had been cut from ear to ear. And a second guy was about to cut me across the front. I managed to somehow uh, defend myself, but in shock and 
vast amounts of blood going everywhere and the bike bouncing about in front of me, managed to sort of just stop the second knife. Um, someone else came up and was kicking me and I, it was all over in about three seconds or something ridiculous. But then I was on the floor and and everyone had gone. And this whole group of other guys were laughing on the other side of the road. And eventually someone came out the bar and they ran off and someone helped me back in. So I had about 30 stitches that night in the hospital and my head just about stayed on. And that was quite useful, really, because had my head fallen off, obviously I wouldn't be here talking to you now. And thankfully, my training enabled me to not have a... But I did, I did, you know, the story. If anything came. Can, out. can I interrupt? We the, we dropped out at what sounded like a critical point. I'll you be, said, "Thankfully, thankfully, my training enabled me to." Oh, I see. And then we, I lost we... you for about five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> are we back now? We are. We are back. Yes. Okay. So yes, thankfully, my. Uh, oh, I wonder what happened. Anyway, my my training. Thankfully, you know, I managed to defend myself against the second assailant and I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't die that evening close to it, but I didn't. So as I was lying there that night in emergency and the doctor was saying to me, I can remember, sorry, but I've got to start stitching you back up because I can't wait for the, the anesthetic to take effect. You've lost too much blood and your head is nearly off. So I'm going to have to start stitching. And I remember lying there on this bed with my head in this little gap, like a sort of massage table thing, as he was stitching away and thinking, OK, I've done Shotokan, I've done Taekwondo. I did a bit of fencing when I was at university. I've done Wing Chun. How is it that after having spent so long training in all these arts that I can't and I couldn't at that time really assess what was really going on at that time in the street and take the necessary steps to avoid that happening. Why was I blinded to that? And secondly, I had this question to myself was, the same as what happened when I found the black belt. To what point am I training? Because was it to, if it was to do with um, defending myself, if it was to do with being able to defend myself, then you know, nothing would have helped that 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 particular evening. I, you know, I, I would have needed a webcam in the back of my head and a pair of Google glasses on my neck and uh, to be armed with a, a, a machine gun to have done anything about it. So if I'm not prepared to walk around with those sorts of weapons and that sort of technology embedded in my head, then why am I practicing the arts? Because it's not clearly just about being able to defend yourself under acts of random violence like this and acts of random violence do do occur so why am i training for what point am i training and it was at that point i think i started to decide that it wasn't so much about techniques it wasn't so much about the strength of a punch or the speed of a roundhouse kick it was going to be from that point on more ideological and so the tools that i would look for would be more principle based rather than practical. Hello, mm. are you still there? I'm certainly still here. So you're yeah. a great storyteller. It's easy for me to just kind of fade out and listen and forget that <laughs> I'm part of this conversation. Oh, sorry, I should be more engaging. <laughs> no, no, please don't. Please don't take take it take it however it feels appropriate. <laughs> So how was that? Was that was that uh, a story? That was quite a story. It's a story that I, I I'll confess in in listening to it, the emotion that comes across from you doesn't seem to add up to what happened. Well, it was a long time ago. But even still, we're we're talking about a, a near death experience in it, an incredibly violent assault for. So far beyond no reason. And there yeah. isn't a bit yeah. of, of 
anger or or frustration or even even as you're telling the story and it's clear that you can recall so much of it so vividly there seems to be no trace of fear or concern or or even an elevated heart rate for uh, the, in the immediate aftermath i can remember being visited by my wing chun teacher and uh, his posse of <laughs> uh, more lethal students and they'd come to see me to say that they were putting the word out that they were looking for these people and that they would find them and i remember spending a long time arguing with them not to do it and that this was not going to satisfy either my my needs or resolve the whole issue of random acts of violence on the streets of london of which continue to this day as part of that that particular neighborhood so part of it was even at that stage recognizing that there was there was little about vengeance or or some form of uh, trying to trying to get back something i'd lost there that clearly was not the story here the story was what it was teaching me and what i needed to do at this particular point i was certainly not immune to the consequences of that attack for the next several years i would freeze when i heard anyone uh running behind me if i heard a footstep echoed on a on a street behind me i would i would physically shake for a while and start to start to just get sweat because I, th- I was thinking that something was about to happen again it was wasn't a conscious thing it was unconscious and it was only i think there was a it was a, t- a time in which i was deciding whether or not having been born in london that i really needed to move away in order to put things back into perspective I'd been studying Spanish. Uh, I'd gone back to university to study Spanish and information technology at that time. And I began a shift towards moving and working abroad. And so that was where I was about to take the next stage of my life. And that was the only way I could break that, that muscle memory of what happened that night. It was so strong within me that I needed to physically remove myself from not only the immediate vicinity, but the culture of that violence in which it was permissible to do and that people would take little steps to prevent and was so readily accepted in that part of London during the 80s, um, which I was a 20-year-old during that time. And so it, it required me to move out of the country, really, and to adopt another language and another culture and another history for the next 20 years, I suppose. And although I'm back in the UK as of last year, um, I felt like I've finally cleansed myself of the whole process. And partly that was to do with that distance, I, I believe. How did that experience make you better? in the sense of other than recognizing where what i wanted to do with my training do you mean however you want to answer it i i and i'll tell you why i'm asking the question go on go on tell me when guests come on and they talk about traumatic events like that it's we tend to go there with them emotionally and we haven't had at least i haven't had that experience as you're talking about this you 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 come across very accepting, very neutral. Um, to to apply almost some some religious tones to it, uh, the way a Buddhist might talk about this experience from from my experience with Buddhists. So I imagine that if you aren't dwelling on the negative side of it, it's possibly because there has been an equal amount of positive. To come from it and i'm curious if you've identified that it, i guess if i'm even correct i don't know jeremy the answer is i, I, I to be honest i i don't know uh, i am not a religious man i'm not a buddhist i'm not a taoist i don't have 
a structure of of knowledge to fall back on and interpret these events in in a way that's going to be more helpful and positive in the future. I've probably just, like most people who go through unpleasant events in life, have encountered unpleasant events in life and have tried to move on with them, but not to forget their importance and the role that they've played in in assisting us in moving. And certainly for me, the, you know, when you talk about, well, what was positive, how did you get out of, you know, what, what made you able to, to not feel anger and resentment and fear in, in, in that way? And as I've explained, there was fear there. There was, there, was, there was even anger and resentment, but I didn't see how I could fruitfully and positively channel that anywhere. So I remember the uh, the police coming around and saying to us, "Yes, yes. Well, I mean, I'm afraid this does happen. Uh, in fact, in fact, it happens about three times a week in different places of London. And you know, one of my best friends, I can remember about two weeks later, uh, was attacked with a machete on the top of a, a bus going through East London. Purely random stuff. And it was a, it was, it was that sense of uh, just sheer." Uh, it was almost like there was, you know, go back to the idea of in a world where there is no sense, you know, there is no, there is no rationality to deal with this. And so for me at that particular moment, I just, at that particular point, I needed to distance myself from it in order to put it into some sort of context. Not that I could resolve it. I couldn't resolve it. I wasn't going to resolve it by giving permission for my Wing Chun club to go and, you know, search out any random English football fan on the street and and uh, take out some sort of uh, punishment. So it was physically moved myself away, and that was what I learned from it, the idea that I needed some distance and space and to rethink ideas about how people behave with each other because I had grown up in that environment and I'd reached a point in which it had become intolerable for me to really stay in that environment and it was beginning to paint the rest of the world for me i didn't believe that there was goodness i didn't believe that there was kindness on the streets i believed there was always this undercurrent of potential violence everywhere so for me it was important to move away physically and experience a different concept of that a different way of living and a different way of relating to people. And I managed to do that in another country, in another culture. And that restored, I believe, the things I needed to find again. And whether this had happened or not, those forces were still uh, running underneath a lot of, lot of events that were going on in my life. And Probably this was the final tipping point, final straw that would push me into another world. So that was the positive, you know. The other thing was that, well, at the end of the day, physical violence is not that big a deal. Yes, you might die, you might not. You might, you know, I still carry scars on my wrists where I managed to de defend myself against the knife of the second assailant. And those things are there to remind me every day that we move on and they are not the most important things that happen to our lives, that emotions and social, cultural, political relationships are far more important than the odd violent eruption. Would you have become the teapot monk without that experience? Um... Don't know, Jeremy. Don't know the answer to that one. That's okay. I didn't hide behind the teapot monk, but um, he certainly did emerge soon afterwards. So you're you're probably drawing connections in in the way that I hadn't previously thought about. But it's possible. It's possible he did emerge from that that, that moment. Tell us more about the teapot monk about what you have going on online your websites i mean you sent me 
quite a list. I mean, you're you're active in quite a few places. You have product offerings. I mean, it, there's there's a lot there. Tell us, we we call this commercial time. <laughs> tell us, tell us what you've what you've got going online that the listeners might okay. be interested in. Well, um, when I moved, I'd been teaching in Spain uh, for the local authority in an area just outside of a city called Granada, and um, teaching in Spanish, which has been tremendous for my language. Um, and I'd been doing that up until year before last. And I decided that I needed to take my teaching in a different direction for a whole number of different reasons. I'd been writing previous to that on the subject of Tai Chi and had published a few books, predominantly around principles, ideas, um, practical applications, not in the sense of, hey, this is a great defense against the front kick, but more in the sense of how you might employ the ideas of Tai Chi in your life to make things easier and to improve your health or your attitudes towards things that you might find difficult. So I'd been playing around with these ideas of what Tai Chi means in the 21st century and trying to divorce it from its past in order to give it this new, this new, what I believe to be a refreshed new brew of tea, if you like. So, yeah, I'd done that. And through the books, a lot of people who had uh, read my book said, hey, you know, you really ought to think about teaching. And I said, well, you live in the States or you live in New Zealand or you, you live in Germany and you live in the UK and I'm in Spain. So unless you come to this very small town in this hot and dusty region of Andalusia, it's unlikely. And they began to say, well, why won't you do anything online? And I said, because you can't burn online. Don't be silly. It's just a fad. It'll pass. Go back and find a class nearer, nearer to where you're living. Eventually, I um, started exploring how well technology could handle this, this disruptive uh, new approach to learning and teaching. So did a year of um, classes online. And over 12 months, I managed to get a lot of people who would follow me online to subscribe to doing a, a 12 month course with me. And over the course of those 12 months, I moved from town to town for 12 different months, spanning three countries. And each month I would upload 20 to 25 videos about applications, exercises, form, culture, language, meaning, interpretation. Some of them were more documentary based, some of them were more practical based. And each of those students would be able to focus on what they were particularly looking for. So if someone wanted applications, that was there. If they weren't interested in that, they were interested in the philosophy or ideology, that was there. If they were interested in the exercises or the form, that was there. And I continued that for 12 months as an experiment and it went really well. I didn't exactly retire wealthy, but it was a very interesting experience. So from that moment on, I decided that I was going to continue to travel, spend more time in movement, because just one of these people who fidget a lot and find my stillness in, in movement and continue to offer online courses um, backed up by different sorts of materials, audio files. Um, podcasts, um, ebooks, and now uh, local classes that I run for free. So I use a, an app called Meetup that you may be familiar with, or your listeners hopefully might be familiar with, in which you can meet up with other people who have got a similar interest and want to learn and someone wants to share their skills. So I advertise in that and I teach classes locally here free with the aim of trying to introduce people into the world of Tai Chi and encourage them to either do one of several things, either stick with me or go online if they can't find a class locally or preferably find a class locally and begin their practice from the town in which they, they live because a lot of people travel to the classes. So that's what I do. And uh, a lot of people say you can't teach online. It's a, it's a 
<laughs> it's, it's not possible. How can you do that? Someone needs to be with you physically and move you around and do this. And yes, that's true. It is a supplementary tool. It's not a, a, it's not a replacement for a local class. But for those people who, and I know someone who's a who's an ambulance driver, and I know someone who's a nurse, and I know someone who cannot possibly re- attend a regular class, and the classes that they may be able to attend locally, possibly they don't get on with the teacher, or they're too expensive, or they're too far away, or they don't like the style, or for whatever reason, they can't see the teacher because there's 40 people in front of them, and they never get a chance to see the posture, or they've been on holiday, and they will never catch up those postures again. So, But those people... Online tuition is a really useful thing, and that's what I try and provide as a as a sort of supplementary resource to books and local classes. And it's going on okay, and people seem to like it. And personally, if I was a non-digital, competent, fairly competent teacher, I would be concerned about how this is spreading quite extensively. And the technology is there not quite yet, but it will become soon where it will be possible to offer even, arguably, a better standard of tuition than even in a... And I recommend other people, other teachers, look carefully at those sorts of developments because it's happening very quickly and moving in lots of different territories that previously it hasn't been into. Certainly, um, if I was in, for example, if I was, for example, say, for example, I was dealing with uh, martial arts equipment I might for it consider for a moment to consider broadening my range of equipment to include the sort of technological necessities for people to record and distribute classes online. Jeremy. Mm. That 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 wasn't a suggestion <laughs> lobbed at me with No, no. With, you with mean a you bit s- of obtuseness or, or, or anything of the like, was it? <laughs> you you sell equipment? No. No, it's, it's, I agree. It's, it's fascinating, though, isn't it? I mean, it's it, it's a, it's it a technology that's displacing everything from lawyers to doctors, and you know, teachers are not going to be immune to this. Correct, correct, and and I'm I'm excited for it because the, you know, one of the questions that we often ask is who would you love to train with, and in ten to twenty years, that will be limited not by proximity possibly even by who's alive, but by a a reasonable sum of money. Mm. Mm. The idea that, you know, I could potentially take a class with you from my home and you could see me just as if I was physically in front of you and I could see you and we could have that experience, I think will be transformative for all learned skills but I think martial arts may even benefit more because what we do has required such hands-on, such attention to truly Mm. progress. Mm. Mm. It's exciting. I'm looking forward to it. (laughs) That's great. Uh, I often hear the opposite from teachers. So it's, it's very, very uh, rewarding to hear someone say they're excited. Because they're scared. They're afraid. There are a great deal of martial arts instructors who teach based out of fear mm. and everything, the, the way they can, they, they quite often will not permit students to train elsewhere because they're afraid. They're afraid that they might find a better teacher or a system works better for them and they won't earn their however many dollars per month mm. rather than becoming the best instructor they can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly we probably all had contact with, with mm. teachers that are concerned about you know, and and I do think this gives an opportunity for us to think of ourselves as teachers, as opposed to martial artists, and that's the big difference. If you know how to communicate, if you know how to convey what's important, if you're able to look at someone and say, "Hey, you know, what I think's right for you is this," as opposed to "This is what I was taught, and I'm going to just pass it on," then that's a different set of skills altogether. And I think for Certainly online teachers, the emphasis is going to shift much more towards your teaching skills as much as it is towards your your ability to flick out a quick roundhouse kick. 
you know, in less than half a second. Mm. Sure. Now, of course, of course, folks, if you're listening, you know, we're going to have a ton of, there are a bunch of links, there are photos, there's a lot of things we're going to drop over in the show notes. If you're new, that is whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. This has been great. This has been so much fun. And I appreciate your time. And there's one more thing I'd love to ask of you. Oh, go uh, on. What, what, what? What is, is it? More, what is it? Just on? one more. I want you to send us out. I want you to give us some some eloquent, life-transforming words. Don't set me up like this. You're putting me on the stage, Jeremy. <laughs> Absolutely. What did I say about stages? Ab- well, <laughs> well, you can, you can uh, repel the monkey as uh-huh. you see fit. Okay. Is, is that that's the correct term? Yes, repulse, 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 repulse the monkey. The monkey. So close. Step so back close. to repulse the monkey. There it is. Uh, so what? What? What was it you wanted again? Uh, you, you, about I'll let you close about? the conversation. How, however, you see fit. We often ask the we always ask the guests to give us some some parting words, something poignant. Uh, poignant. But this whole this whole conversation has been poignant. So if you wanted to take it in a different direction, this is your episode. All I've done is respond to you, Jeremy. You have directed me from behind the scenes, from your director's chair. I'm just the actor in front of the screen. You but can. I'll try be poignant. I'll try. Okay. I'll do my best. Um, a big big part of what I do online, if anyone's ever seen me on mm-hmm. Instagram and anywhere else, I have this thing about don't study the art, play with it. And partly, hello, still there? I've heard a. Mm -hmm. oh good right i just thought uh there was a funny sound this end anyway so yeah that idea of playing as opposed to studying is is always been an integral part of my approach to teaching and it's so much so that um it reminds me very much of this have you you must have heard of it it's impossible for us as human beings to frown and smile at the same time yes so uh, I do think sometimes in martial arts we frown a lot and we are very serious about what we do and particularly, possibly more so in Tai Chi where we have this obsession about details, about exact weight proportions, about the angle of your eyebrow or your your elbow in a certain posture and we get overly serious about it. So my, my advice simply is that uh, drop the serious nature of what you're doing don't frown too much tai chi is meant to enhance your life not replace it um and embrace the differences don't try to eliminate them so i always end up saying play more and study less there was a there's a brilliant philosopher called george bonachur who said we don't ever stop playing because we grow old but we grow old because we stop playing so my final words are something like loosen up hum more songs whistle while you kick, drink more tea. Okay, I think I should go now. It's certainly not a new experience to have guests on the show let down their guard to talk about who they are, what makes them tick. But I think we've had very few, arguably if any, who are more open than our guest today, Mr. Reed. I was honored, I was humbled by his words, by the things that we talked about after the show and just truly thankful that he was willing to share his time and his stories. I loved him. So thank you, sir, for coming on the show. If you want to find the show notes with links to websites, social media, everything that this busy man has going on, you can find them at our show notes, whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. If you want to find our products, those are at whistlekick.com. They're on Amazon, a whole bunch of other places. Maybe they're even in your martial arts school. If they're not, we do have wholesale accounts. I want to thank everybody for their time, for their support, for the great conversation that comes after these episodes that floods my inbox. I love it. I have the best job. So thank you for that opportunity. And that's all I have. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.